right, in this video, I just want to talk a little bit about antiderivatives and how we find them for some really basic functions. This is just a short video to get you used to the idea and practicing with some of our first functions that we use. So for an antiderivative, I want you to think that it's an antiderivative. So really what we're doing is undoing a derivative or we're doing the opposite of a derivative. So if we're given a function f, an antiderivative of f would be another function, I write big F, like a capital F, such that the derivative of big F is equal to little f. Okay, so this is a lot of words here, lots of little f's and big f's, but the main idea is that we are finding a function where we take its derivative and get the function that we were handed at the beginning of the problem. So if I hand you a function, you want to find its antiderivative, you want to find the function that it came from, that we could take its derivative and get to that function I handed you at the beginning. So again, instead of differentiating, we are anti-differentiating. We're going backward from the derivative to the function that it came from. Okay, I think the best way to see this is to look at an example. Okay, let's say that I give you a function f of x equals 4, and I want you to find its antiderivative. So we are starting with the derivative, that's 4, and we want to find an antiderivative. So the antiderivative would be big F of x. We often just use the same letter so that we know that they're connected. And that would be equal to, let's say, 4x. This is the antiderivative. Okay, how do you know this? Let's check. So if we think about going backward, the derivative of 4x is 4. So the antiderivative, when we take its derivative, we get the thing we started with. So it works. We made an antiderivative. Okay, let's try this for another function. Let's say we have g of x equals x. I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna learn how to do this all the time, but I'm gonna tell you an antiderivative for it is big g of x equals 1 half x squared. So, okay, how do you believe me? Let's take the derivative of g, the big G. We bring the two in front, so we have 1 half times two, x to the two minus one power, and then we just get one times x to the one, which is x. At this point, if you've been taking derivatives for a long time, it's probably not too hard for you to look at the big G function, the 1 half x squared, and see, okay, if I do power rule, I'm going to get x as my derivative. Okay, so the function x has an antiderivative of 1 half x squared. Now, I just want to give one more comment before we move on. So what I have is just an antiderivative for these functions. But let's imagine we added a constant onto the end of these antiderivatives. Okay, so let's say I add 10 to the end of this first antiderivative. When I take its derivative, the derivative of a constant is 0, so that plus 10 would go away, and I'd still be left with f of x equals 4 as my derivative. Or we could add a different constant, we could add 500. The derivative of that is still 0, it goes away. I could also subtract a constant, like I could subtract 3 eighths, that's still a constant, it's still going to go away. So what we do to accommodate for this is that we often write a plus c at the end of our antiderivative. This is just to represent that there could be a constant as part of our antiderivative, and when we take its derivative, it goes away because the derivative of a constant is zero. And so we just write it there to represent that there could be a constant there. And we'll do the same for the big G of x function too. Okay, so before we move on, I want to talk about a subtlety that often happens in the language when we're asked to find an antiderivative. So I can ask you to find the general antiderivative, and this will have a plus c to encompass all possible antiderivatives. So it has that addition of a constant to handle that the derivative of a constant is zero, and there might be a constant there. And whenever we do this, we call it the general antiderivative, since it represents all possible derivatives. However, I can also ask you to find an antiderivative, and that's any function that has the needed derivative that we're looking for. So in this example, you could choose a constant to add on, you could not add a constant at all. This is just one specific antiderivative that works. So we have the general derivative, that has the plus c, or we have an antiderivative, which is just one that works. Okay, so for the rest of my video, I'm just going to focus on general antiderivatives, so you'll see plus c's all over the place in my answers. Okay, so for most of the antiderivatives I want you to see, we're just going to think about what we know about derivative rules. But there's one example that I want to make sure you have a general rule for so you know what to do, and this is specifically for power rule. So the general antiderivative of f of x equals x to the n, one of our power functions, is big f of x equals 1 over n plus 1 
times x to the n plus 1, and then plus c for that additional constant. So here we're taking the existing power on the function I gave you, the n, and we're adding to it. So we have 1 over n plus 1, and then we have x to the n plus 1. So whereas in power rule for taking derivatives, we subtracted from the constant, here since we're working backward, we're working from an antiderivative perspective, we're going to add to the exponent instead. So let's just check that this works. So let's say I want to take the derivative of my big F and show that I get that x to the n I started with. So I'm going to take the derivative. Then when we do power rule, that n plus 1 constant comes down in front, and we decrease the exponent by 1. So I subtract 1, and the derivative of a constant is 0. So here I have n plus 1 over n plus 1, and my new exponent, since those 1s cancel each other out, is just x to the n. Then n plus 1 over n plus 1 cancel each other out, and I'm just left with x to the n. So this works as our rule for finding an antiderivative of x to the n. Just a comment that I didn't write here, but hopefully you can sort of make sense of, is that we can't do this when we have n as negative 1. Since we'd be doing negative 1 plus 1, which would be 0, we'd be dividing by 0, can't do that. And negative 1, x to the negative 1, is actually 1 over x, which has its own antiderivative, natural log of x, since the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. So that's just our one example that works a little differently. Okay, let's run through a bunch of examples so you can see this in action. Let's find the general antiderivative for the following functions. First, let's say I have j of x equals 4 and k of x equals 3x. Okay, so for j of x equals 4, we're going to use big J of x for the antiderivative, and this one is 4x plus c. So what you can think about for this is that lines have a constant slope or a constant derivative. So when you see a constant answer for your original function, like a 4, you know that its antiderivative has to be a line, it has to be a linear function. So we just put that x on there, 4x plus c, to represent a line. The derivative of that line is just the slope, which is 4. And we can always check by then taking the derivative and making sure we get back to where we started. So the derivative of big J is 4, which is what we started with, with little j. Okay, let's move on to the k of x equals 3x example. So for the antiderivative, let's call it big K, and I'm going to use that general antiderivative rule I just gave you for functions in the form x to the n. So the 3 we leave by itself, it's just a constant multiplied by the x as a coefficient. And then our exponent is 1. So what I'm going to do is do 1 divided by n plus 1, which is 1 plus 1, times x to the original power plus 1. So I've just added 1 to that exponent and written it in the appropriate spots. And then I have my plus c. We can't forget our plus c. Now we just need to simplify to make this look like something a little cleaner. So we have 3 times a half x squared plus c. And I'm just going to write this as 3 halves x squared plus c. So again, if you're looking at this video, you're probably pretty comfortable taking derivatives. So I think the best thing you can do is to get an answer and then just check it, like make sure it gives you back what you started with. So here we can take the derivative of big K, the two comes in front, that's going to cancel with the two in the denominator. And so we're just left with three X. And again, the derivative of that plus C is zero, so it goes away. And we get three X, which is what we started with. So we know that this is the general antiderivative. Okay, so I'm just going to move quickly through some other antiderivatives. This video is really just to get you used to the idea and not to go too in-depth about any of these things. Working on antiderivatives is one of our main concepts we do in integral calculus in Calc 2, so you don't need to worry too much about totally understanding all of the nuance right now. We're just getting used to the idea of working backward now. So I'm going to give you three new functions. Let's say we have p of x equals cosine, q of x equals negative sine, and r of x equals secant squared. And we're still trying to find the general antiderivatives here. So for our first function, I'm going to use big P of x for the antiderivative. I really want to be thinking about, OK, I have cosine. What function has a derivative of cosine? What could I have started with and then taken its derivative to get cosine? Well, I think the answer is sine. So let's try it, sine x plus c. The derivative of sine is cosine, so we get back to where we started, and that works. We just had that plus c there again. Remember, we got to put that on for the general antiderivative. 
So sine x plus c is our antiderivative. So again, let's try it for q of x. So what function has negative sine as its derivative? Well, that's cosine. So cosine of x plus c will be my antiderivative. And we can check by taking the derivative. We should feel pretty good about that. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. There we go, we got back what we started. So this antiderivative is cosine x plus c. You might notice I've given you sort of straightforward ones just to get you used to it here. So now we have r of x equals secant squared. What function has secant squared as its derivative? Well, that's tangent. So my antiderivative, big R of x, is tangent x plus c. And I can check again in my brain just thinking, OK, really quick, what's the derivative of that? The derivative is secant squared, so that's good. That's what I started with. OK, so the last two examples I want to show you are just two more you might encounter. So let's say you have w of x equals e to the x and z of x equals 1 over x. So for the first example, we're thinking, what function has e to the x as its derivative? Well, that's just e to the x. The derivative of e to the x is itself. So our solution for the antiderivative, the general antiderivative, is e to the x plus c. And we can just make ourselves a little note to check this derivative is e to the x, which is what we wanted. OK, then for z of x, I'm thinking, what function has 1 over x as its derivative? So big z of x is actually going to be natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. So since this is just an intro video, I really don't want you to worry too much about why those absolute values are there. But really, it's just because 1 over x, what we started with, could have positive or negative values for x. So it could have negative values like negative 4, negative 10, negative 100. But natural log can't take negative values. It doesn't have that in its domain. All of the inputs to natural log have to be above 0. So it's from 0 to infinity, not including 0. So we have to put the absolute value on there just to make all of the inputs positive in case there were some negative ones that we started with. Otherwise, it wouldn't work because we can't take natural log of negative numbers. OK, so that's just a little note. So we could check our for ourselves to make sure the derivative looks like what we started with. I'm getting 1 over absolute value of x. Just note that we can't always just sort of hop back and forth between the derivative and the antiderivative and have everything work out completely perfectly. So that's why this is happening with the absolute values. The important thing to know here is that if you're given 1 over x, its general antiderivative is natural log of absolute value of x plus c. OK, this was just a little introduction video into antiderivatives. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you in the next one.